My name is Dr. David Much. I'm a gynecologic oncologist at Washington University. One of my areas of interest is endometrial cancer, and that's what I'm here to talk with you about, specifically about molecular targets for endometrial cancer. That is, bullets that are very specific for specific abnormalities within an endometrial cancer. These are exciting times for any cancer treatment, but particularly endometrial cancer treatment, in that we are understanding the development of this cancer, and we can actually target specific abnormalities at the DNA level that are responsible for causing the cancer. This is in its infancy. However, we are making significant progress, as you will see. So we are going to talk about that cancer is really a molecular disease. That is, it is caused by an accumulation of errors and abnormalities in the DNA that lead to an abnormal expression that leads to the cancer. We'll specifically talk about the molecular alterations that occur in endometrial cancer and then the targeted therapies that we think that we can use. Cancer is the end state of a natural evolutionary process. There have to be several sequential mutations that must occur in the DNA that lead to the malignant tumor. This is a little bit confusing then, or makes it a little bit confusing for us in terms of what mutation to target, and that is one of the things that we're learning. But we are making progress. Endometrial cancer is comprised of two types of cancer. Uh, first is type 1, and we know a lot about type 1. As you can see from this slide, we believe that type 1 endometrial cancer progresses from normal to a premalignant abnormality called atypical hyperplasia, to low-grade cancer, to a high-grade cancer. And there are many mutations that you can see from this slide that are associated with that progression. And we can target many of these specific abnormalities. We are not real good at it yet, but over time we will become good at it and can likely target future treatments to treat this cancer with much less toxicity. The other type of endometrial cancer, the one that's responsible for the most deaths, is the type 2 endometrial cancer, and that would be something called papillary serous cancer clear cell cancer, and a mixed mullerian uh, tumor or carcinosarcoma. And there, there's often atrophic endometrium or normal endometrium that looks completely benign, and suddenly there must be some catastrophic molecular event, probably related to P53 mutation, that leads to this the sudden formation of this cancer. So let's go through what targeted therapies, what targets we have. Well, the old tried and true therapy for endometrial cancer is hormonal therapy. Remember, the endometrium responds to estrogen. That, that makes the endometrium grow. And then progesterone, that makes the endometrium regress. Well, similarly with many endometrial cancers, hormonal therapies can be effective. So progesterone typically would make the endometrial cancer regress if it expressed hormone receptors. And as you can see from this next slide, hormonal therapies will lead to a response. And there are several hormonal therapies that we can use. The classic is progesterone. We can use tamoxifen, which is an anti-estrogen. We can use gonadotropins, which are secreted from the brain and suppress estrogen. And we can look at aromatase inhibitors. Patients with breast cancer are treated with aromatase inhibitors. So let's take this particular patient of mine. 
She is a 72-year-old woman who presents with a well-differentiated cancer. So well-differentiated endometrial cancer is much like the original tissue. So the differentiation part goes well-differentiated, moderately differentiated, and poorly differentiated. The more well-differentiated, the more likely the cancer is to respond to hormonal therapy. In this case, the patient was first diagnosed in 2001. Unfortunately, she recurred in 2005. She was treated with standard chemotherapy, adriamycin and carboplatinum taxol, many agents that many of you have thought about. Um, and then she had persistent disease. And she was treated with uh, tamoxifen alternating with megase, which is a progesterone. She had uh, stable to slowly regressing disease by this criteria for almost four years. She was then treated with cytotoxic therapy, and then she had aromatase inhibitor in the form of letrozole or Famara. And finally, cytotoxic therapy. And she lived to be 81 years old. So she lived with recurrent disease for over eight years. And it was hormonally responsive. So without much toxicity, she was able to get a good amount of time and responded well. And this is an example, perhaps, of targeted therapy. Patients in our society who get endometrial cancer or this kind of endometrial cancer are often obese. And as you probably know, there is an obesity epidemic in our country. By the year 2020, 75% of our nation will be overweight. And so this will drive the number of endometrial cancers up, hence increasing the number of patients like the one that I just described. There are many mechanisms that we have hypothesized lead to the increased association of cancer with diabetes and with obesity. And these are listed here in this slide, insulin and insulin-like growth factor, sex steroids, something called adipokines. Obese patients tend to have le are less well oxygenated and in there may be a genetic susceptibility to being obese. So those are issues that we will have to address. But something that we did note was that these patients who are obese and develop endometrial cancer were often on metformin. And those patients on metformin apparently lived longer and had a better prognosis than those off metformin. This has prompted a targeted trial, a trial that would uh, prophylactically treat patients with endometrial cancer with metformin. And perhaps we hope that that will improve the survival in this group of patients. Similar set of data have been derived from those patients with breast cancer and other cancers. So as shown in this slide, the take home message is that and one that one should look at in the future is that metformin is a possible treatment modulator. That is, it's a possible chemopreventive agent, and metformin may act by modulating something called the mTOR pathway, which we'll talk about. We need much more data, but this is something to keep an eye on because this treatment would be safe and relatively non-toxic. We also know that metformin may potentiate, at least in cancer cells, um, the effect of standard chemotherapeutic agents. So I mentioned the mTOR pathway, or the mammalian target of rapamycin, that's mTOR, and we have a series of mTOR inhibitors. We know that that's an important pathway that's often mutated in endometrial cancer. And P10 is the most common gene that's mutated in endometrial cancer. And we feel that perhaps we can, if we inhibit mTOR, that pathway, that, that could lead to potential treatments for endometrial cancer. So a inhibitor of mTOR, other than the metformin that I mentioned, is something called tezeromolimus. The mTOR, it is an mTOR inhibitor. 
and inhibits then the pathway caused by P10 mutations, which occur in 60 to 70 percent of endometrial cancers. And it seems reasonable to try in endometrial cancers because it's also active in renal cell cancer. And renal cell cancer and endometrial cancer at least share many mutations and are histologically similar. Um, and this is the data regarding mTOR inhibitors. Tem Temsorolimus, a response rate of 25%, and a series of 19 patients, a response rate of 7%, and a stabilization rate, though, of 51% in patients being treated with Temsorolimus. And then other mTOR inhibitors also had some activity. So this is a, a pathway that we believe you know, could be important in the future. The next pathway that I mentioned here in red, we are looking at antivascular endothelial growth factors, VEGF therapies. And you may have heard of some of these drugs called bevacizumab or Avastin. And it's very active in colon cancer. This slide shows that it is active in colon cancer. This paper was published in the New England Journal. And here is some of the data showing that that is the case and that these patients lived longer. Overall survival and disease-free survival was higher. This particular drug, Avastin, has been approved as a single agent for endometrial cancers. Next would be something called epidermal growth factor receptors. That is receptors on the surface of the cell that affect growth. We have inhibitors of these. These are overexpressed often in late endometrial cancers. These inhibitors are small molecules. There are very good phase two studies indicating that there may be some activity. One is gefitinib, lapatinib, and erlotinib, or tarsiva. And these agents are show some activity in endometrial cancer treatment. The next identified in red here are the kinase inhibitors. Gleevec is one. It's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that you may have heard of. It's very active in many cancers, and it is potentially active in endometrial cancers that if we can test for appropriate targets, see kit, for instance, or uh, platelet-derived growth factor receptors, or uh, BCR ABLE, so we, if we can identify those specific mutations, then Gleevec may be an appropriate treatment in that group of patients. Herceptin, similarly, is a monoclonal antibody against some of these tyrosine kinase receptors. And in fact, if the patient has appropriate profiling, it may be appropriate to treat a small group of patients with this drug, though clinical trials have been somewhat disappointing. Finally, endometrial cancer is related to an inherited disease called Lynch syndrome, which is associated with mismatch repair. That is the inability to repair DNA mutations that might occur in the course of general living. And about 5% of endometrial cancers are at increased risk to have this mutation. And all endometrial cancer patients should probably be tested to make sure that they do not have a mismatch repair defect. If they do, then it's important to know this for their offspring. At this time, we don't have any targetable agents for patients with a mismatch repair defect. But soon, I believe that we will. And finally, we have the experience of Washington University and our SPORE grant, that is Specialized Program of Research Excellence, where we, with the help of Pam Pollock, an expert in FGFR2 mutations, have identified a series of important mutations. Dr. Powell, also a member of our faculty, was one of the investigators on something called the Brivenib trial, this agent inhibits FGRF2 and it actually showed some promising results. What we learned from this trial, though, is that there are 
through about 800 samples of endometrial cancer. The line with the little circles is representative of the DNA. And we identified many mutations in FGRF2, or fibroblast growth factor receptor 2. But what we also identified is that only four that are actually activating mutations, that is, they they cause increased expression of the FGRF2. And when that happens, and this FGRF2 is overexpressed, then that is a feature of cancer. And we don't want to target just the mutation, any mutation. We want to target the activating mutations. And so at the current time, we are specifically seeking out drugs that will act upon only the activating mutations. There can be lots of different mutations, but they may not really be important in terms of the cancer. But the activating mutations in this particular pathway are important. And so we are working on drugs that will specifically act on those particular mutations. So we are coming a long way in terms of identifying 